How's everybody doing this morning? Happy 4th of July weekend. Four people love that. Four people love freedom. Everybody else takes it for granted. Rock on. This is going to be a terrible sermon. You're going to have a miserable time today. I guarantee you that. But I think about um, 4th of July, I think about freedom. And uh, freedom is not free. Freedom is not free. And if you're enjoying freedom and you didn't pay for it, somebody did. And so if we didn't pay for it, we need to at least appreciate the people that paid for our freedom, right? Um, if somebody buys you lunch, I hope you appreciate that. You know, unless you're a teenager, you don't appreciate anything. You think everybody owes you something. I don't know. That's a different message. But, but when somebody does something for us, we appreciate it, right? And, and, and we're celebrating the independence or the freedom of our country, and, and that's awesome. And then, but then I think about it. The Bible says that um, when the Son of God sets you free, he, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. So when Jesus sets you free, you are free. But the Bible also says in Hebrews that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, which means if Jesus didn't shed his blood for us, there's no forgiveness. With no forgiveness, there's no freedom. Freedom is always at the price of blood. And we've had people in the military who have fought, defended us, defended our country so that we could have freedom, and they paid with their lives. And, and some of you even have family members that, well, most of us have family members that serve, but also some have family members who've died and, and shed their blood so that we could be free. And we have to remember that. But the ultimate freedom comes in Christ because he shed his blood so that we could be free from sin. Amen? And so we want to celebrate that this weekend. And I know you're going to have a great time with family and friends, and that's good. But, but it's also a good time to reflect. Seasons are good to stop and reflect on what God has done for us and to appreciate also the people that serve and are a blessing to us. Amen? Amen. All right, we're going to have a great time in the Word of God this morning. At least I'm going to have a great time. If you love the Word of God, I think you will. If you don't like the Word of God, you're going to have a miserable time. This message will be absolutely offensive. Thank you, sir. Did anybody test that? I'm getting a little nervous. But uh, a lot of times people... They have a crazy mindset about the word of God. They, they want to go to church and they don't want it to bother them. They're like, I just, I just want an encouraging word, you know. Just say something nice to me. Make me feel good about my sucky life. We, did, we didn't come here for somebody to cheer us on in our sucky life. You can get that on the radio. You can get that on TV. You get a self-help book. We come here to get the word of God so we know what the word of God says so we can change the way we think. If we change the way we think, we can change the way we live. Amen. We don't want to hear that it's going to be okay. We want to know what to do for it to be okay. And not for just, check this out. We don't want, just, this, this is the key. We don't want it to be okay. We want to be okay. Like even if it's bad and I'm okay, I'm going to make it, even if it's not a good situation, right? So sometimes we're hoping for things to change, but we don't need things to change. We need a change. The way we change is in Christ. Jesus can help you change. If you follow the word of God, you can change. It doesn't mean the situation is going to work out, but you'll be able to work out in the situation. Amen? And that, that's God's plan for our life. All right, this morning we're going to have a, a, a great word about being a servant in Christ. I want to show you a video first, uh, partially because I think it's funny. Um, also because it's got a lot of really good points in it. You'll enjoy it. I think you will. Especially, yeah, you'll enjoy it. Father, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you for a time of worship that we could be here with family and lift up the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask you to minister to us through your word. Minister to us. Convict us. Help us to change. Help us to receive your word. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, go ahead and show the video real quick, guys. Previously on Church Hunters. This is your first church. This is Creekside First Baptist. Honestly, right up front, uh, didn't love the name. The Sunday morning experience was just a little too traditional. Hey guys, how we doing? Hey, good, doing how are good, you? Doing good, doing good. So I know you didn't love the traditional vibe of the last place, okay? Yeah. okay? But I think this church is really gonna do it for you. Yeah. It takes relevance to a whole new level. Behind me, you will see molded clay, jar art, tapestry, canvas, mosaic wow. church. Mm, I love beautiful. it. Right? So you've you, heard of interdenominational. Mm -hmm. right. And you've heard of non-denominational. Mm -hmm. Well, this church identifies as interdenominational. Wow. Wow, that's, that's perfect for it. us. It really is. But here's the kicker. A lot of celebrities go here. Yeah. What? Jeff Foxworthy. <laughs> we love him. Yep. We really do. Ben Higgins from ABC's The Bachelor. <gasps> perfect. Several Real Housewives. Ooh, wow. And Usher even came here one time. <laughs> yeah. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, well, follow me. Come on. Let's do it. <laughs> so refreshing. Honestly, that last church was just way too traditional. It was yeah. 
too much. It was like we left there feeling convicted, like, oh. ugh, right? Right. We're just, we're looking for more of a Tony Robbins type sermon. Like inspiration, like a TED Talk with a Bible verse. Yes. Oh, yes. Right? It's perfect here. We love it. It really is. We love it. Awesome. Cool. Well, you guys know a lot of contemporary pastors speak out of the Message Translation Bible. Mm -hmm. Right. Or this pastor speaks out of a brand new translation. It's the Tumblr Bible. Shut up. We love Tumblr, though. This is great. A lot of emojis, a lot of abbreviations. Oh, I couldn't ask for one. And how many seats in here? Oh, it is 6,000 altogether. Babe, 6,000. I got to be in this worship band. Imagine me. Up on that jumbotron, mid guitar solo. Do you know how many Instagram likes you get? Oh. oh my gosh! We find it hard to find a church right now because I grew up Catholic. I grew up and Baptist, so so like we we drink. Yeah, but in private. I mean, obviously you get it. Basically, in terms of like worship, I think we're looking for like a Jesus culture type feel. Oh, I right. love them. Hillsong, obviously. Oh, obviously, leading you to the cross. Hillsong is great. Like a Bethel minus the spontaneous yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Just for me, I connect and worship more when the leader is attractive. Personally, I'm a Carrie Job guy. Oh, okay. Well, she's married. So. Um, so is Christian Stanfield. Wow. <laughs> so one of my personal favorite things about this church is the service times. Okay. There's an 8.30, a 10, a 1 o'clock, a 5.30, and even a 7 o'clock service. Oh, there's nothing around like 2-ish? Yeah, for us, for what we need, 2, 2.15 is best. Yeah. Uh, how many songs do they do during worship? Usually five, five and a half, depending on where the spirit leads. Oh, wow, babe, is that, is that a, a lot? lot? Well, if that's too that much for you, they have a program here called the Worship Assist Program. Okay. So if you ever get tired during worship, an intern will come out and just hold your arms up. You just keep worshiping the King of Glory. Just like that, wow. I love it. Oh, you can still look super spiritual. And my arms get so tired from yoga. Oh, same. I actually like this church. I think we can make it work. It was all right. I mean, it was it was good, but pers like I emailed the pastor and he didn't immediately respond. So uh, we're taking these vessels elsewhere. Did you guys like that? I, I don't, it kind of fits in the sermon, but I just liked it. So I wanted to share it with you. All right. This week we're continuing the discipleship series and we're talking about the disciples servanthood. The disciples serving her. We're talking about being servants. And uh, I, I, lo I love Jesus, obviously. That's kind of a weird thing to say, I guess, if you're preaching. If you don't love Jesus, sit down, right? Um, but I love some of the things that Jesus does. He does cool stuff. He's talking to his disciples, and he says, guys, I got a question for you. They're like, all right. He's like, who's greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? And they're like, Psh, the guy that sits at the table is greater, obviously. And Jesus says, yeah, except I came as the one who serves. Jesus does that all the time. He asks them questions, they answer the questions, and he's like, yeah, but I do the opposite. And then now they're stuck. Because what happens is the way we used to think about things, Jesus flips them upside down. It's funny because sometimes when I'm in third world countries, I find I, I'm nice to people all the time. I'm nice to servers, I'm nice to waitresses, and, and even if I drive through Jack in the Box, I'm nice to the people in the window. Even if they're having a hard time, it's like, you know, you're working at Jack in the Box. You're probably not having the best day, right? So I'm nice to them, even if they're in a bad mood, whatever. I don't care. It's not a big deal to me. But I find that the, the, the rudest people are in third world countries from people who grew up poor and then came into some money. They treat their own people in their own country where they came from the worst because they're trying to make a separation like I'm above you like I came from that and I don't want anybody to think that I'm like you is that crazy so it's a mindset of serving is low but but how many of you love your moms how many of you know your moms are the ones that like make your food right how many people know that makes me love my mom more if you bring me food, I love you. It's automatic. That is a subtle hint, by the way, if you feel like making me something. So, but we love our moms. Our moms serve us. That's what they do. And we love them. We respect them. And you think about, when we think about society, we look at people who serve as lower. And that's crazy to me. I, I don't get that. Of course, I had that mindset before I was a Christian. But when you come into Christ and you're, you're in Christ, you have to change your thinking. And Jesus says, no, serving actually makes you greater. It doesn't make you lower. It makes you better. The Bible says that, that God gives grace to the humble. So if you're humble, God will bless you and empower you, right? 
but he opposes the proud, which means if you try to go higher, God will push you down. If you go lower, God lifts you up. So the way up is down, and the way down is up. It's the opposite of society. We, we always want to go higher and push people down, and God says, oh, no. And some people say, if you try to do it on your own, God will let you. That's not what the Bible says. It says he opposes the proud. You try to do it on your own, he will oppose you and make sure you fail. Are you here? The Bible also says that pride comes before a fall. And the Bible says to consider others as better than yourself. You know why it says that? Not because you're trying to be humble, but because other people are better than you. What? I thought being humble was trying to pretend that I don't think I'm better than you, but I really know I am. No, that's religion. I met a guy one time, and he, he also does work in the Philippines, and he's an older gentleman, and he's, he's kind of nerdy, you know? It's kind of like what you would picture, like missionary guy that does orphanages and stuff like that. He's like that. And I started talking to him. He was the nicest, most genuine person, one of the most genuine people I ever met in my entire life. And when we finished talking, I was talking to another pastor that had introduced us. And he's like, what do you think about that guy? I said, that guy is way better than me. And he said, what do you mean? I said, he's a better person than me. He just is. Like, and that wasn't me trying to go, look how humble I am. I just met somebody and thought, wow, so many things that I'm not good at, this guy's way better at. He's just, man, he's been doing it for a long time with a great heart with a servant's attitude, and, and I literally thought, and you know what I realized? When, when you're trying to be humble, you're, you're probably battling with pride. <laughs> it's quiet in here this morning. When you're trying to be humble, you're probably not. But when you just recognize that some people are just better than you, you're probably realizing that, you know, but they say that once you realize you're humble, you lost it. You ever hear people try to tell you how humble they are? Are you guys alive? You didn't get coffee this morning? I had a lot of coffee this morning. I'm good. I don't know. But I was in, in Indonesia, and we went and did this conference. We were training these guys, and men and women, that were being ordained as pastors. And we'd been training them all week. It was super hot there. It's crazy. And at the end of the week, the guy who's leading this trip that I was on, he says, okay, now tonight what I want to do at the service is I want us to wash their feet because we want to prove to them how humble we are. And I said, no, you want to go out there and look spiritual. I said, we don't have to prove anything. We paid our own way to fly over here, paid our own way to stay in a hotel and our own food, and then we taught them every, every day for eight to ten hours for five days. We're serving them. We don't need to prove anything to anybody. And he says, well, if you're too proud to wash people's feet. How many people know when they say that you just have to do it, right? So I was like, wow, this guy's annoying. If you're trying to prove you're humble, you're actually just fake. How many people already got that? You don't prove that you're humble. You serve somebody. You don't have to go, now watch me wash your feet, you know. Because we're going to read the story about Jesus doing that. But he wasn't saying, hey, guys, look how humble I am. He was teaching them something that I'm teaching you right now. And so I was thinking, man, I got to go wash these people's feet. And then I told the Lord, I said, Lord, you know my knee's jacked up. Like at that time, my knee was hurt. And I, and I said, if I have to squat down, I'm going to blow my knee out. It's not going to make it. I was having a really hard time on the trip. And I told the Lord, so if you want me to blow my knee out for your glory so people can get their feet washed, fine. You know, they can't wash their own feet, whatever. So we went there, and this lady came up, and I was supposed to wash her feet, and there's a bowl there and a towel. And there's, you know, a few of us were up in the front, and people were coming in a line. And I was, here I go. And I went to squat down, and I was like, here goes my knee. It's going to explode. I'll just stay down there, you know. So as I went down, I felt this super heat, like, in my knee, and God healed my knee, like, the second I kneeled down. And I was in so much shock because I was really being sarcastic with God, like, thanks a lot. This is what I get for serving you, right? I kneel down. My knee gets healed. Now I'm weeping and washing these people's feet, <laughs> thanking the Lord for the privilege of washing their feet, that God healed me while I was serving them. Are you here? Man, God, I want healing. Your healing will come when you start to serve somebody else. When we stop thinking about us and ourselves, and, and we go to church, we're like, like the video, you know, what can you do for me? You know, what am I looking? It's not, what can we do for you? What can you do to serve other people? When you start to serve other people, 
that's when God will do something to bless you. Amen? And then when I was washing their feet, there was a worm in the bowl of water from one of the people's feet. And it was swimming around. And I was literally like putting the towel away from the worm to get the water and then try to wash the people's feet and uh, avoiding the worm. We don't know what kind of worm it is, but it came from somebody's foot. So it obviously enjoys hanging out with people. I didn't want it to enjoy hanging out with me. And then this, this woman that was going to be a pastor came up and she was wearing like a pantsuit, you know. And she takes her shoes off and she pulls her pants up like that. Her legs were four times hairier than mine. Okay, now it doesn't matter how hairy my legs are or aren't. Hers were four times as hairy as mine. And I was like, Lord Jesus, that's where the worm wants to go. I should put the worm back and send him home with somebody. But that didn't happen anyway. So, Oh, it did happen. It's true. But I didn't put the worm. I just left it in the bowl. Tried to avoid it. How many people would try to avoid the worm? What would you do if there was a worm in the bowl? Like long and skinny and white and like wiggling around like that. Like, Take it out the bowl. I'm not touching it. It was some kind of weird parasite or something. No, I'm not going to touch it. Luke chapter 22, verse 27. Jesus said, I am among you as one who serves. John 15, 20. No servant is greater than his master. Who wants to be great? Four people. Everybody else wants to suck. Who wants to be great? You have to serve. Jesus says, the, the servant is greater. If you want to be great, you serve. How can I become greater? Serve somebody else. Amen? Um, I'm going to skip down here and get Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1 through 4. This is, I'm going to give you two sections of scripture. We're going to build the points off these verses, okay? Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1 through 4 says, here is my servant, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. In his teaching the islands will put their hope. That's good, right? All right, it's talking about Jesus. And Jesus is going to be our example, obviously, um, as the ultimate servant. In John chapter 13, this is the story I was talking about when Jesus is washing the disciples' feet. Verse 4, it said he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that he poured water in a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. The crazy thing about this is that you, you got how many people... You, ever, you walk around barefooted. Not right now because your feet would look like bacon, right? Because it's hot. You walk outside. You come back with bacon, you know? So how many of you when you were little kids ran around barefooted in the summertime anyway? And you'd like try to run to the shade, right? You're like, go to the shade. Here's some grass, you know? I don't know why we didn't just put on our shoes. We didn't. But when you walk around barefooted, you, you don't have to do it long around here that your feet are black, right? They are dirty, now think about a culture where they live and it's dirt roads everywhere. There's no cars. Everybody's walking and they're wearing sandals. So their feet are exposed to the road. They walk all day everywhere they go, sweating, dirt, sweat, dirt. Come on, somebody. It's getting funky, right? Okay. Now you go in and you're like, hey, let's sit down and eat some food. Well, that doesn't sound like a big deal until you realize the table is this high. How many people know when the table's this high? Your feet are close to the table. I don't know about you, but I don't like to eat with people's feet on my table. So what do they do? When they come into the house, a slave washes their feet. When they're going to prepare to eat, a slave will come in and wash their feet so that they can sit at the table and eat, right? Jesus gets up, puts on, takes off his outer coat, wraps a towel around his waist, and grabs the bowl and the towel and sits down and starts to wash his disciples' feet. Their master, the Lord, the, the most controversial, incredible rabbi of his day, they could never imagine the Pharisees and the Sadducees or the priests ever doing anything like this. Jesus throws off his robe, 
picks up the, the bowl and the towel of a slave, of a servant, and starts washing their feet. Can you imagine how that would feel? That would be a little humbling, right? It would be like, whoa, this is, this is not right. Then he gets to Peter. you got to love Peter. Because if you have a loud mouth and you make a lot of mistakes, Peter is encouraging to you because he made it. Right? You ever read about Peter and you're like, I would do something stupid like that. <laughs> so he came to Peter and, he, and, and he, Peter says to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus says, you do, not now, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. And, and Peter, no, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Now, the awesome thing about that is people sometimes try to think that Peter's being humble. Like, oh, no, I can't let the Lord wash my feet. We find no place before Jesus died and was raised from the dead that Peter was humble, not even for one second. Okay, it, it didn't happen. It happened later, but it didn't happen at this point. And so Peter's getting it. He's not dumb. He might be, you know, a little anxious and rambunctious and, and, and loud mouth and, and might be the first one to stand up and say something. But he's not an unintelligent person, right? He understands that Jesus is always telling them, what I'm doing, you're going to do. Jesus is washing his feet. And Peter's thinking, there is no way I'm washing anybody's feet. That's a slave's job. I'm not doing it. He's washing my feet. And if he's doing that, he's thinking that I'm going to wash somebody else's feet. And then he tells them, because he wants to appear religious, right? Oh, no, Lord, you can never wash my feet. I'm not worthy. What he's really saying is I ain't washing nobody's feet. Right? And Jesus says, well, you don't get it right now, but you're going to understand later. And then he says this. He says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Which basically is saying, I'm going to wash your feet. You're going to receive this example. You're also going to do it for other people. Or you're out. Man, Jesus would not be a good pastor in 2017, would he? He'd be like, this is what we do, or you're not a disciple, you're out. What kind of church is this? I'm looking for the church of clay of the mosaic, right? <laughs> like, Jesus would not be a popular pastor today. But then Peter's like, hold on, because he's wild. You know, Peter's wild. And then Peter says, then, Lord, not just my feet, my hands and my head as well. And Jesus says, take it easy, dude. I ain't giving you a bath, man. I'm trying to teach you something. <laughs> well, that's not exactly what he said. But he did say something like that. Jesus said, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body's clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. And then he looks at Judas. <laughs> How many people know when you're up to no good, and your pastor gives you that sideways look? The I know what you're up to. How many people know when he said that, Judas was like looking around. He's looking at the worm in the bowl or something, right? He's not even paying attention. And it says, for he, he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, returned to his place. He says, do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, here it comes, Peter, you also should wash one another's feet. Peter's like, I knew it. I knew this was coming. He says, I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Verily, tr very truly, I say verily. I'm reading King James. That, I mean, that's what I usually read. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do. Does it say do? Notice it doesn't say you'll be blessed if you know them. He said, now that you know it, you'll be blessed if you. Man, that's the problem with the church right there. That's the whole message. Man, I know about serving. Nobody cares if you know about it. What we want to know is, are you doing what you know? So many people are trying to learn. Everybody's learning. Nobody's changing. Everybody's learning. Nobody's doing. Too many people are interested in learning something new, but they have no interest in putting into practice what they're learning. They want to go to church and hear 57 new sermons, something new. Teach me some revelation. Teach me some word in geek. Teach me some word in Hebrew, right? They're like all into it. Get my brain all stimulated so I can feel good about myself. But don't ask me to do what the Bible says. Jesus says, you call me master. You call me teacher. You call me Lord. You got that right because I am. And I just gave you an example. And what I did, you're going to do. And the church says, oh, no, we're not. I'm going to come a little late to church so I don't have to talk to anybody. And then I'm going to slip out a little early so I don't have to talk to anybody. 
And I'm going to make sure that I don't go too much because I don't want ask anybody to ask me to do anything because I'm just coming to get my spiritual. Are you here? And then Jesus says, no problem. You have no part with me. If you don't do what I'm doing, me and you are not together. You just know about me. How many people know Manny Pacquiao? You do? You know him? Oh, you, you heard of him. How many people know I have his cell phone number in my phone? I'm name dropping now. Even though he lost last night, but he's still awesome. I, I don't know about him. I know him. How many people know there's a difference? How many times has Manny called you? I remember when he called me. I saw his name on my phone, and I was like, look, you guys, it's Manny Pacquiao. He's calling me right now. And I was like, oh, I better answer it, right? <laughs> it's not okay to know about Jesus. A lot of people know about him, but you got to know him. And even if you know him, Peter knew him. Jesus said, if you don't do what I'm doing, you're not with me. Are you here? If you want to know the Lord, you got to serve him. You can't say you love him if you don't care about what he cares about. He cares about people, and he uses people to help other people. You might be thinking, yeah, but you don't know what I'm going through. You know what? Other people are going through other things too. Maybe you're going through something, but maybe you could help somebody else. I've shared this before, but the ministry has saved my life before. The fact that I had to go to church. How many people know when you're the pastor, you got to go? You can't go, I don't feel like going today. You got to go. And sometimes just getting here, somebody needs to get this message right now. Sometimes just getting here and standing in worship in the presence of God can, can keep you going. And then when you serve somebody else, how many people know your miracle can come? You, you got to do something for somebody. You cannot just come to church, not just this church, any church. You can't just come to church and sit up in there and receive. At some point, you got to contribute. Thank you for your enthusiasm and your participation. All right, I'm going to give you some principles from the Lord's life that are to be reproduced in our lives to be disciples, to be servants. And I know you're going to freak out when I tell you this. Don't panic, but there's seven principles, and I'm going to be done. Well, my timer says eight minutes and 21 seconds, but it's 4th of July, Independence Day. I believe in freedom. I'm not going to be ruled by my timer, so I'm going to give myself five extra minutes. So instead of eight minutes and probably 18 seconds, we're going to do 13. Eight, seven points in 13 minutes. I know you don't believe me, but believe in miracles with me. Number one, dependence. Dependence. If you want to be a servant, you have to be dependent. What does that mean? Isaiah 42, 1, the verses that we first read. He is my servant whom I uphold. I remember a guy told me, he was an atheist. He was arguing with me about um, how you can be a Christian. He was telling me Christians are weak and all this stuff. It's pretty awesome. I'll tell you the whole story sometime. But he finally told me, he said, you're so weak, you can't make it without Jesus. You lean on him like a crutch. And I acted like I was all offended. And I said, how can you say that? And he was like, what? And I said, I don't lean on Jesus like a crutch. That would imply that I had some strength. I'm not leaning on Jesus, man. I failed. I'm laying on Jesus. He's holding me up. I'm not. And when I started preaching, I started getting all crazy. I was like, I'm laying on Jesus. I'm dependent on him. He's holding me. And he don't want to hear that, you know, because he's an atheist. And, but then he told me he believed in survival of the fittest. And I said, well, it's funny because you're a skinny little old guy. We're in the middle of a desert in a three-story tower alone. And I can throw you off this tower on your head. And you're telling me that you believe in survival of the fittest. And he says, well, I'm not talking about like me and you, I'm talking about, I was like, I hate when my theology gets tested by real life. How many people know he could have been converted? Ah. Hi, Jesus, you're real. Too late. If you want to be a servant of God, you got to be, you guys are like, what are you talking about? That's just a piece of the weirdness that's in my mind. You have to depend on God. If you're going to be a servant of God, you have to be dependent on him. Jesus didn't do anything in his own strength. He said that. He said, I don't say my own words. I say what I hear the Father saying. I don't do what I want to do. I do, check this out, what I see the Father doing. So Jesus is dependent on his Father. How much more do we need to be dependent on the Lord? Amen? That we need to say, guys, say what the Bible says. 
Too many people are like amateur counselors. Like you've been a Christian for like 15 minutes and now you're like, oh, let me tell you this thing that I learned. When I, nobody cares what you learn. Speak what you hear. It comes from the word. Tell them what the Bible says. Amen? Yes. Or oh man. And just don't do whatever you want. You don't get to just serve and do whatever you want. Do what needs to be done. Number two, <laughs> acceptance. Acceptance. In verse one also it says, my chosen one in whom I delight. Also, the father um, met with little more than disappointment with his servant Israel. Israel as a people disappointed the Lord. He wanted them to take his name to the world. They didn't do that. They failed him. But Jesus succeeded where they failed. Because Jesus, that's why the Lord, when, when Jesus got baptized, he came out from the water. And what, what did he hear from heaven? So, so, what are you guys speaking in tongues? Jesus got baptized. He came up out of the water. The Holy Spirit descended like a dove. The heavens opened up. And what did he hear? This is my, in whom I'm well pleased. Right? Why was he pleased with his son? Because he was obeying. Because he was doing what he was sent to do. How many people want to be accepted by God? Oh, man, that's good. Did you, how many people want to be approved by God? How many people know that... We say this all the time. God is love, right? And he loves you. And he'll never love you more than he loves you now. God loves Satanists. Sometimes that blows our mind. But you could worship the devil and God will still love you. But he'll love you and send you to hell. How many people know his justice doesn't get taken away by his love? Are you here? Okay. So God loves you no matter what. That'll, that'll never change. His love is unconditional. His approval is not unconditional. His approval is conditional. Are you here? How many of you have kids? You love your kids all the time. You don't always approve of them. It's like, I love you, but what you're doing is wrong. If you want my approval, do what I ask you to do, right? It's the same with God. We learn that from him. God is like, this is what I want you to do. Well, you don't love me anymore. Oh, no, I still love you, but I don't approve of you because you're doing wrong. You're not doing right. If you want to be accepted, obey. Amen? Number three, self-effacement, which we talked about a little bit already, or, or being humble, self-effacement. Verse two, it says, he will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. Now, what it's saying is he's not going to draw attention to himself. And like today, the, today you can watch any preacher on TV, on YouTube, on, you, you can hear them on the radio, and they have this big flashy production, and they're out there. And a lot of times, their marketing actually exceeds their message. You can buy marketing. You can't buy a message. You have to pay for a message with your life. But people buy. And, and I always hate when the marketing is so awesome and the message is so weak. I, I always like it better when I'm surprised. I'm like, whoa, that was really good right there. But today's about self-promotion. Think about this. What, what's a selfie? Who the hell takes so many pictures of themselves? And then you open their phone and their screensaver is them. It's like, what the heck is going on? And then you have Snapchat, and Snapchat is just a picture of me with gay stuff on me. <laughs> are you kidding me? Like, we are so much about promoting ourselves that it's disgusting. Jesus was the opposite. Jesus healed a dude that had been paralyzed his whole life, and then he said, don't tell anybody. And the guy's like, uh, I, I can walk. I'm, I'm going to tell everybody, right? But you can't blame them. But Jesus was self-effacing. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible is Isaiah chapter 6. It talks about when Isaiah goes into the temple, and that's the year that the king died. And when he went in, he saw the Lord in the temple. And the Bible says, and the train of his robe filled the temple with his glory, and the angels were flying, and they were saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of his glory. And I love this. one of my favorite chapters ever. But an interesting thing about that is it describes the angels that are flying in the temple where the Lord is. And it says they had six wings. How many people know that's weird? Shouldn't angels have two wings, right? Shouldn't they be chubby and naked like on the, you know, they sh but they're not. Angels are scary and they, people freaked out when they saw them. They were like, look how cute. So the angels are in there flying. They have six wings. And it says, 
With two, they were flying. Two, they were covering their feet. Two, they were covering their face. Why did they do that? They don't want you to see them. They don't want you to know who they are. They want God to get all the glory. They don't want you to know anything about them. And your feet represent what you do. They were covering their feet because they don't want glory for what they do. So they're covering their face to hide their identity. They're not trying to show off what they do. They're flying, and what are they crying? That They're crying, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of his glory. And that's an example of what a servant is. And Jesus wasn't trying to promote himself. He came to serve us, and then he came to die on the cross so he could rescue us. We need to get about the business of serving somebody else. We need to help hurting and broken people. That's what a servant of the Lord does. We're not like, like on the video, the guy's like, yeah, an usher even came here one time. Why do people, what's celebrity giving their life to Jesus is one soul. If you lead 10 crack addicts to the Lord or one celebrity, you could say, see, this thing does not rule my life. Shut up. People are like, oh, the celebrity got saved and everybody will go all crazy. But a soul's a soul. 10 people going to heaven. Those people are just as valuable to God as a person who's a celebrity. But we think so wrong. We're, we're over here trying to get promoted. We're trying to be somebody. We're trying to look good. Jesus wasn't doing that. He was teaching, look, guys, you need to just humble yourselves and serve somebody right where they're at. Amen? Number four, empathy. Empathy. Now, what empathy means is it means that I'm, I'm able to step into your shoes and, like, identify with how you're feeling. Does that make sense? And I can have compassion on you. Sometimes we want to say things like this. I know how you feel. Sometimes we don't know how people feel in a situation. It's impossible, right? And, and then we know we can't say that because we don't know. But you can have empathy, which is, man, I'm really trying to understand how hard this must be for you. See, that's empathy. Empathy is saying, I don't get it, but I care. And as much as I can understand, I'm understanding. And I want to try to help. Does that make sense? Because, you know, if somebody has a, a primary family member die and, and we haven't experienced that and then they're going through, you can't say, I know how you feel. If you've been through it, then you know how they feel, right? But, but a servant looks at people, considers their situation, and to the best that they can, they understand them and they try to reach out to them. You know, um, one of the pastors in Yuma, Alicia, she's, we make fun of her because she was homeschooled. She's like a typical homeschooled white girl, like can sew up something real fast right there, like homeschool. That's what they teach. Nobody's laughing. Nobody else thinks that's funny. I think it's hilarious. So we make fun of her. You don't have to, but we will. And um, when she first started her, her life group, she started getting people, and she had this idea in her mind who she was going to reach, right? You know who she reached? A heroin addict. And she was helping this girl get off heroin, and like walked with her through withdrawals, everything, and was working with her. And the next thing you know, because she helped her, she had more heroin addicts. And, more, and the next thing you know, she got a ministry of people who have had a hard time being homeless and people that were living at the mission and people that were kicking heroin. And here's this little white homeschooled girl <laughs> using street slang about heroin gear that I never even heard in my life. She's never done a drug in her life. But it didn't stop her from having empathy and ad identifying and trying to understand how these people feel and getting involved in their life and helping and serving them. Are you here? That heart is what led her to grow her ministry and now she's a pastor. She's ordained as a pastor. She doesn't do that stuff because she's a pastor, but she did it when she first started her life group to help people that were just hurting and broken. People that were so completely different from her. You think you have to reach people that are like you. No, you have to reach the people that God brings to you. A servant will serve them and try to help them where they're at no matter what. Amen? It's not good enough to know these things, guys. If you want to be with Christ, you have to do these things. Number four, optimism. I'm not good at this one. Number five? Yeah, that, that is a five, isn't it? Five. <laughs> Optimism. Optimism is, is being able to look at things in a positive way, right? Well, my natural man, my nature, I'm, I'm a pessimist. I'm very, I can be very negative. And then as a Christian, because I have faith, I now have become stoic, which is not a good example either, which is it doesn't matter whatever happens, I'm going to make it. That's also a bad attitude, right? 
A good attitude is optimism, believing that something good is going to come out of the situation. A pessimist will never be an inspiring leader. Jesus was a realist, but not a pessimist. Now, how many people know you can't just act like, you know, like if somebody's sick, you, you ever see people that do that? Somebody's sick and, and you're like, man, I'm sick. You know, I need you to pray for me. Don't say you're sick. Okay, well, you can't deny the fact that there's a virus in your body, right? It, faith isn't denying something. It's believing that God could change it. Faith is believing that God could heal me. Here's a fact. I'm sick. Here's another fact. Jesus is a healer. His blood is more powerful than my disease. I can be healed, and I'm believing that over this fact. That's faith. Faith isn't, I'm not sick. Okay, if you, try to, if you deny that you're sick and you get healed, you can't give God the credit. What if you tell your friends, I got healed. I thought you said you weren't sick. Well, that's how it works, though. We pretend like we're not. I'm sick. This is what the doctor said. There's a report right there. Good enough. Now I'm going to look and see what the word says about my healing. Right? So I'm a realist, but I also am, a, am an optimist in that I believe the word of God and that God can change the situation, can change me. Amen? But in serving, we got to believe that God will change somebody else and that people can change. What do you do if somebody tells you I'm sorry and then they do it again? What's the saying go? Fool me once. Shame on you. Fool me twice. Fool me three times. I'll hunt you down and shoot you at nighttime. No, just kidding. That's not how it goes. But the funny thing is, when people mess up, we forgive them. I made a decision even before I became a pastor, that I was going to believe people every time they repented. I never challenge it. If somebody tells me, I'm sorry, I, I love God, please forgive me, I choose to believe them every single time. Optimism is choosing to believe in people. You can't serve them if you don't choose to believe in them. And, if, and, and don't think, well, they're going to probably do it again. You know what? Chances are they will. But let's keep believing every time. Amen? Amen. Then you have a better attitude. Amen? Yeah. How many people know if you have a better attitude, that will help a lot of things? Number six, anointing. Some of you are like, annoying? I got that. No, not annoying. <laughs> anointing. In verse 1, it says, here is my servant. I will put my, my um, spirit on him. So anointing. When we talk about anointing, I'll just teach this real quick. We talk about anointing. Some people think it's like some hyper-spiritual thing that you can't really grasp. And when you ask people, what is it? They can't really explain it. They're like, well, it's hard to explain. It's like, you know, the Holy Spirit. And let me, let me teach it to you simply like this. Okay, the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, right? He's God. He's everywhere at once. Got that, right? Okay, the anointing is the presence of the Holy Spirit. So now you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. If the anointing is the presence of the Holy Spirit and he's everywhere all the time, then isn't everywhere and every person and all the time anointed? No. This is what a friend of mine says. The Holy Spirit's everywhere at once with everyone, but he's thicker in some places than others. Did you get that? What does that mean? It means when we're dependent on him, Holy Spirit, I need you right now so I can serve these people. When you say, I need you, you become an empty vessel, he fills you up. If you want more, become less. If you want to do greater things, become more dependent on God. If you want to be supernatural, do what you can in the natural, and then be honest with the Lord and say, what I have is not enough. I need you to help the people. Then you get the anointing on top of what you're doing. Is that good? And then number seven, supernatural. Say supernatural. Okay, what's the second part of the word? Natural. What's super mean? Greater than natural or more than natural, right? Okay. How many people would like some supernatural in your life? How many people would like to see the supernatural on some things that you're doing? Okay, now watch this. I'm going to help you. Put the word back up. Who the heck is I'm working here? All right. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to reach. What's that right there? Natural, right? Don't, my hand, just pretend you can't see the first part. Really. Just work with me. Okay, so it's natural, right? How many people want supernatural? How many people know the more than natural is God's part? 
Are you here? It's supernatural. It's not just super. God's always super. He's always more. How many people want supernatural? God's waiting for your natural. We want the supernatural to make up for our lack of commitment. We want the supernatural to make up for our lack of commitment. We want the supernatural to make up for our lack of discipline. We want the supernatural to make up for our lack of work. But supernatural is when I'm all in. God, I'll do everything that I can to help and serve the people. And then God says, man, I like that heart and the attitude. I'm going to touch your natural with my super. I'm going to add something more to that. Now it's more than you. How many people would like it to be more than you? Well, God wants it to include you before he adds the more than you. God, show up and do something because I'm not. And the Lord says, I can do every, anything, but I won't because I've chosen to limit what I do through you. When you're all in, the Lord says, I'll be all in. Yeah. Are you here? Yeah. He says, you get in all in, I'll get all in. You get all in and say it's not enough, and God will touch your natural with the super, and it becomes more than natural. It becomes supernatural. But as servants, we got to get all in. Amen? Yeah. Does that help anybody today? Yeah. Come on, you want to serve somebody? Yeah. Listen, you can serve in the church. You can serve at Life Group. At your job, serve somebody. When you see people that need help during the week, serve them. Look, I don't want you to know this. Be not hearers of the word only, but what? Doers of the word. We have to do it. Serve somebody this week. Make up your mind. I am going to serve somebody this week, and I'm going to do what I can to help someone, and I'm going to pray and ask God to touch it and do something supernatural. Amen? All right, come on, let's be standing together. Father, thank you for this morning, and thank you for your word. Thank you for every person that's here and thank you for Jesus. Lord, not only for dying on the cross, but for giving us so many examples and, and helping us realize that, that you're standing against our culture and the way that things are and you're, you're challenging us to always renew our minds according to your word. Lord, today, I pray that we would really get it in our heart and in our spirit that the servant is the greatest. Come on, receive that today. Maybe you've had a little bit of insecurity in your life and a little bit of pride, or maybe you've come from, from nothing and you don't want it to look like you're nobody. Well, I want you to know right now in Jesus' name that you are somebody in Christ, that you became successful the day that you gave your life to him, that you are somebody, you count, you are valuable in Jesus' name. That when you humble yourself and you serve somebody, it doesn't matter in man's eyes if you look like less. In God's eyes, you became more that day in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that as we serve, that you would anoint our hands and our feet and our mouth, the words that we speak, the way that we serve, that you would touch it and you would do something supernatural. That it wouldn't just be us doing it, but you would do something incredible to help somebody, comfort somebody, strengthen someone, encourage someone, help them out of their situation. Lord, that you would anoint us with your Holy Spirit, that we would be an example of servanthood in the name of Jesus. Help us to change our minds. And in our families, Help us to serve, to be servants in our family. Lord, we love you. We love you with all of our hearts. Come on with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. If you're thinking today, yeah, I need to get on it. I need to be, I need to be a servant. Just raise your hand. I want to pray for you for a second. Lord, for those that are raising their hands right now in Jesus' name, pour out your spirit. This week, Lord, this week, speak to them as they're living their life and you show them somebody they can serve. Speak to them by your Holy Spirit encourage them and anoint everything that they do that it would be supernatural and somebody would be blessed and we thank you in jesus name amen amen